There's two portions of scripture to read this morning, and we're going to read the first one now. You'll find it in the book of Genesis in chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, as we continue on, I looking at the life of Abraham. Genesis chapter 21, and we'll commence to read at verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was waned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was waned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bowshot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What he aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew, and dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. And we know that God's word will not be turned unto him void, Our other reading this morning is from the New Testament, from Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And we'll be moving between these two passages a little later on. Galatians chapter 4. Listen to the words of Paul with regard to this story. Verse 22. Galatians 4 and 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the born woman was born after the flesh, but he of the, bo- of the free woman was, was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar, uh, it's a girl here, but uh, if your Bible is like mine, in brackets there's Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, 
for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And I hope that I can explain in some measure what Paul is saying here in Galatians chapter 4 with regard to the birth of Ishmael and also the birth of Isaac. For the benefit of those of you that may not have been here last week, and just to recap our, our um, minds again, or th- put on our thinking caps, well, we were looking at last Lord's Day how we had Abraham, who after quite a number of years was returning to an old sin. And we noticed as to how that he came to Abimelech, and he said to Abimelech that Sarah was his sister. And he repeats the exact same thing all over again as he had done many, many years earlier. Then we're told as to how God had shut up the wombs of those of the house of Abimelech, that there would be no children born to those women. And then eventually, well, Abraham came clean as to what was happening. And Abraham prayed, and we have already covered how God opened up the wombs again of the house of Abimelech. Because eventually Isaac would be born. He would be born as the son of promise. He would be born to Sarah as the mother and Abraham as the father. And where we concluded last week was that if Abraham had have taken some time out and if Abraham had have judged his own sin, then Abraham would never have been in the dilemma that he got into again. And we concluded last week that very often it is much easier to judge everybody else's sin than it is to judge our own sin. And we find that very, very clear in the story of Abraham and Abimelech in the previous chapter. I want to move on into chapter 21. And the very first words of chapter 21 tells me that God is faithful and that his word is faithful. And where are we at now? We're told that Sarah is 90 years of age and Abraham is now 100. And there's all this excitement because a son has been born. Now, I imagine if this was today, we know that it was against all nature as such that this child would be born. But I imagine if this was to happen today, people wouldn't be very excited about it. I imagine that they would be maybe hiding away, they'd be shutting themselves away. I'm sure many of us know, I know I do, a lady that became a mother whenever she was 52 years of age. And I tell you, she was in an absolute shock whenever she announced to her boys that were 19 and 21 at that stage that she was going to be a mother again. She kept it to herself for quite some time. She had one of her boys was getting married And I remember her thinking, this is a dilemma because here I am and I'm 52 years of age and I'm now pregnant. But we find that in this passage here that Sarah is 90 and Abraham's 100 and they're excited and they're shouting about and they're dancing about. I'm a father, I'm a mother, I'm 100 years of age and I'm a father here. And we're told in the first few verses that there's tremendous excitement whenever Isaac has been born. Now, three times in the first two verses, God's word is mentioned that the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Now, there was an awful lot in between all this story, but God was still fulfilling his word. And verse 2 tells us, For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And if you have a cross-reference there, we'll go back to Genesis 17 and 21, that exactly Abraham knew whenever this son was going to now to be born. We're told whenever he was eight days old, Abraham takes the son to be circumcised as God had commanded him. I'm sure we're all familiar with what Isaac means. The name Isaac means laughter. And we're told that Sarah laughed 
And Abraham laughed, and everybody was laughing in excitement because this child has now been born. And we find in the midst of it all, well, there was three laughs that was mentioned. There was a time whenever Abraham fell on his face laughing in chapter 17 and verse 17. There was a laughter of unbelief that we've already covered whenever, you remember, Sarah was hiding behind the tent or the skin of the tent, the goat skin, and she begins to laugh whenever this message had came to her. And now they're laughing in joy because a child has been born. It's many years ago now that we had a young couple that were in our house. And they were telling us about the birth of a child. It was their firstborn. They were tremendously excited. And nowadays, of course, things maybe are different from the previous generation because fathers are very often included now along with the mother. This couple were sitting and they were telling us about the birth of the child and they were very excited about it. But the lady she announced to us, she said, you know, after the child was born and her husband was present, her husband announced, he said, I just couldn't go through this again. Now, I don't know what way the wife felt about it, but that was how the father felt about it anyway. But we find that that Isaac is born and there's tremendous excitement. Now, you may ask me where are we at in the story now? In this tent here, which is the home of Abraham, you picture what all is going on in this home. And I have said, dear friends, today, and I reckon I'm long enough in the ministry to be aware of it, that there's none of us know exactly what goes on inside somebody else's home. And as I listened to the news this week, and as I'm sure that you did, with regard to the tremendous scandal that is present here in our own land, All I could do nearly as I listened to the news whenever I was driving the car was nearly cry for those children where you had a mother that breaks down in court, where you have a mother charged with abuse of all sorts and also a father and a former policeman and many, many others, no doubt, that have already been lifted. And we know the other day where there was another gentleman that was up in court too. But I thought to myself, all those years ago, 30 years ago or whatever, with five little children that were entrusted by the Almighty God to bring up in a God-fearing home, and those children have eventually obviously taken that very courageous step to come right out and to face the consequences, and I'm sure they will, of what has happened to them in the past. But I'll say it again, none of us know what goes on behind the closed door. None of us know what goes on behind the smile and the laugh. None of us, dear friend, really know that. But I want to bring you today to this tent, and inside this tent, you have Hagar, you have Sarah, you have Abraham, you have Ishmael, and now there's a son called Isaac. And in this fairly complicated setup, there's a civil war breaks out inside the home. There's a tremendous civil war that is going to go on in the home because we know that there's children, there's two families that are inside the one home. One is going to reckon that they're going to be treated better than the other. And so that led to all sorts of complications. Now, my wife was saying in her children's story there about the pick and mix. And how easy it is to pick and mix through the Word of God. And that's why I said, dear friends, a number of weeks ago, in fact, back in January, believe it or not, whenever we started this series, that was my intention to preach chronologically through the story of Abraham. And to look at the different uh, facets in Abraham's life and in Sarah's life, because we can't bury our heads and say these things didn't happen. But I want us to notice, of course, the spiritual application of the life of Abraham and how God used Abraham eventually for his own glory. But we find that Ishmael is now 14 years old. And verse 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, and he's mocking. 
Now, that was going to bring rows into the home. This wasn't going to be a very happy home because you have this lad who is 14 and he's, he's mocking now and he has listened, no doubt, to the life of his father. He has known that his father believed in the true God, the God of Abraham, of course, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. But they we're told that in the middle of all this, that Sarah, she I notices, well, my child's born, and this other half-child, or half-brother, rather, by the same father, of course, that it's not going to work out. And so Abraham and Sarah, as they've set up their household, they realize that there's a problem inside their tent. Now, he has watched, no doubt, he has been told about God and about the miracle of his birth, and how that he was born, Ishmael was born unto this handmaid, I called Hagar. And the text tells us that things come to a head, and Hagar finds herself in a terrible situation. I visit a little lady, a lady that I'm very, very fond of, who has never been through the door of this church, but I have had contact with for many, many years, right up until this day. And she told me on one occasion about, and she told it wasn't confidentially, she told lots of people about it, about how one day her son decided to get married. And what her son decided to do was he would bring his new bride and to live with the mother-in-law. Now, that's the route that he, uh, that he decided to go down. And everything went very rosy for a little while, and then one day civil war broke out in this home. And the lady that I visited told me, she said, I happened to be carrying a saucepan one day. There was tremendous tension in the home, and my daughter-in-law pushed up against me. Now, this is a quite a sprightly little lady. I think she could hold her own okay. But she said to me, she said, you know what I did? I sat the saucepan down, and I took into the daughter-in-law with my fists. So much so, she says, that the daughter-in-law, she fell on the ground, and then the daughter-in-law got up again, and she shook herself, and I says, what did you do? She says, I took into her again. Would that be a happy home? I don't think so. I think, actually, it would be better dwelling in the tent than in the midst of all that. But uh, we find here, dear friends, that in many ways there's this tremendous row that is going on inside the tent. And that brings me to the reality of rejection here. We find in verse 12, wherefore she said unto Abraham, Abraham, you've got to do something in this situation as either one goes or the other goes. And she puts up her case. And she says, she's already concluded, she says, you must cast out this bondwoman and you must put out her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. You've got to do something about this here because this can't continue. And we're told that Sarah, she's full of resentment. Uh, The jealousy and the hatred begins to build up. Uh, She sees Ishmael's uh, reactions to it all. And so we're presented with a very tense situation. Now, Abraham, well, he has great remorse in it all. Uh, He is, of course, commanded that he ought to obey Sarah, his wife in this case, and he ought to cast out the bondwoman and also her son. Now, we know that he was part of the problem at the very beginning. We're aware of that. But I want you to notice, dear friend, that Abraham had a relationship with his son. This son was 14 years of age. Sarah may not have had the relationship. She was not the biological mother of this child. And I realize, as I've said before, that if you do some studies in psychology, you will notice that I very often, that whenever children are adopted out, that those children can even do better than with their biological mother. And so I'm aware of all that. But I'm saying this, dear friend, that in the midst of this very tense situation here, Abraham is in distress, we're told. And the thing was very grievous or very serious in Abraham's sight because of this son. What is he going to do? He's piggy in the middle here. He's got to sort out this problem. He's not going to please the two women. 
He's not going to please the two families eventually. And so we're told that they brought upon him great distress. Now I reckon it was very hard for Abraham to do this. Because they've had 14 years of a relationship as a father and a son. It was going to be very hard. But Abraham says there's no other way around this. And he sends her away. And verse 14 tells me, And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on, on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away, and she departed. And she wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. It was a hard thing to do. We know that Hagar had a problem. The water runs out, the sun's beating down, and Hagar, she's going to give up. And so she takes her son and she sets him under a shrub and she sits away at a distance away from him and she reckons, well, my son's going to die in the middle of all this. But God, of course, remembered Hagar. I want to say to your friends that in Hagar's heart there was tremendous pain in verse 16 as she thought her son was going to die. She's convinced that Ishmael will die. She doesn't want to witness his death, and so she leaves him under this shrub. Now, we know, and I've preached on it many years ago, on the word that came to Hagar, Thou God seest me, that God sees her right in the midst of her situation. That God sees her. And, dear friends, I would say as we move on today, that very often troubles will come into our lives, and they'll come in unannounced, And they'll come in unwanted. That's the way they arrive. But very, very seldom will uh, we ever maybe be aware how quickly trouble will enter into our families, our our lives. But it will come. And so if we bury our head in the sand, well, we're never going to be prepared for it whenever trouble actually does arrive on our doorstep. And this Old Testament story is a very important story, and we've been reading about the New Testament implications of it, that we have Ishmael, and we also have Isaac, and we have the command of Sarah that she needs to cast out this bondwoman because the two of them can't dwell together in the same tent. And so we find in the Old Testament that this story is very important whenever we come to the New Testament and vice versa. There's some tremendous symbolism here that is used. We find in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22, For it is written, written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. And then we're told in verse 23, But he that was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. And so that was the flesh. Ishmael, Paul says, was of the flesh. But he that was of the free woman, which was Sarah, was born by promise. And that was the spirit. Now, he who is of the born woman here was born according to the flesh. You may ask me this morning, what actually is the flesh? And I'll say this, dear friends, that the flesh is whenever we try to solve our problems without God. That is a very simple definition for the flesh. We sing sometimes, the arm of flesh will fail us. We dare not trust our own. The flesh feels is sufficient for every situation. You see, God had promised Abraham a son, but he took things into his own hand whenever Sarah gave to him her handmaid. And so after salvation, the flesh still hangs around. Paul tells us what the flesh are and what the works of the flesh are. And it's good for for us to be aware of it as to what the flesh actually does. We hadn't time to read it today, but in chapter 5, we're told again about the flesh. And verse 17 tells us, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But we will come to what Paul's conclusion was, and that was to walk in the Spirit, and that will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so inside our lives, whenever we're saved, we have the flesh. And the flesh is whenever we try to do things our own way. 
We know that I, Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans 7 and 18, Now I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The arm of flesh it will feel us. Then we have Isaac, and Isaac is a picture of the spirit. He was born in a supernatural way. Remember his mother's 90 and his father's 100. Romans chapter 4 and 19, And being not weak in, in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. The spirit. The spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and so on. That is the spirit. Which Paul says we have the spirit and we have the flesh. Whenever you and I come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our divine, the divine nature of God takes possession of our lives. The Holy Spirit takes control of our lives whenever we are saved. But what happens? We have the Ishmael, which is the flesh, and we have Isaac, which is the spirit. Paul tells us very, very clearly. Now, Paul says that Ishmael is going to persecute Isaac, exactly what we've been reading about in Genesis chapter 21. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and so Paul wants us to understand And that brings me, dear friends, to where I really want to conclude this morning. And that is where Abraham was told he needed to cast out the bondwoman. Because the bondwoman shouldn't be living with, the two of them shouldn't be living together. And so he tells us to walk in the flesh and will not fulfill the lusts of the spirit. And I want you to notice what the scripture says here. Cast out the bondwoman in verse 10 of chapter 21. Likewise, Paul uses the exact same terminology uh, writing to the church at Galatia. There's the parallels between how Abraham dealt with Ishmael and how we are to deal with the flesh. Now, I know that Paul lays tremendous emphasis with regard to growing up in our Christian experiences. And Paul tells us that as newborn babes, we ought to desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. And then he writes to the church and he says, you are still in the milk and you should be in the meat. You should have developed more. And he uses the terminology of a child. And the child is a type again of the flesh. Child likes his own way. Do you ever notice a child gets very huffy if it's not going his own way? You let them play football or something together, and if it's not going their own well, well, they'll take their ball and they'll move to another pitch or to some other team. That's the child. They've never grown up. That's the child spiritually. It's their way, or it's no way. No way, no one else's. We had, last night, a family get-together for one of my brothers that was fifth day. And I suppose there was quite a number there. And one of my nieces passed through Mark whenever we were going home last night. She says, you wouldn't think there's 50 or 60 in that house because nobody seems to be crammed in it. And I suppose that was true. But my sister told me a story, which I've heard her tell me before, and it was about whenever my grandfather died. And she said that they were warned, they weren't allowed to look at my granddad, you weren't allowed to look at anybody whenever they were dead. It's all changed, of course, now. And what happened? She said that she was nine and a half years old then, near 60 now. And she was told, well, we're all heading up, and I was only a year and a half, we're all heading up across to the neighbours. And whenever the funeral and all was leaving the house, there was nobody to be seen about it because children didn't look at death. They were kept away from all that. And she says, as a young girl of nine and a half, well, she was inquisitive. What actually goes on at death? What goes on here? And so she says she disobeyed all the authority of her mother and her father, and she decided whenever the, the hearse was leaving the house 50 years ago, that what she would do was she would bring us all down and she would line us up at the opposite side of the house, and we'd all get a good look at the funeral. I don't remember it, of course. But she was bringing it over to us as to how that even as children we like our own ways. She says, I tell you one thing, we got some scolding, or I did, because you were all my responsibility the day that your granddad was buried. 
And I say this to your friends. You look at a child, you learn a lot from a child. And Paul said about the children, he says, but there ought to be no more children tossed to and fro. I'll say it again, you look at a spoiled child. You look at a child that gets his own way. Paul uses tremendous symbolism in the church at Corinth whenever he's illustrating the Christian that has never grown up. And he illustrates it by the spoiled child. It'll be their way or it'll be nowhere. And what does Paul say here as what Abraham was told to, that he needed to cast out the bondwoman. Ishmael is to be put out. Hagar is to go also. Why did he do it? He did it because God told him to do it through Sarah. It was a very personal thing. Only Abraham could do it. He made the decision to obey obey God even whenever he didn't want to. The flesh can only be dealt with, dear friends, by you personally. And I'll say it again as I've said on other Sunday mornings. You are responsible for your Christian life. You're not responsible to sort out everybody else. You're responsible to examine yourself. And it's very, very personal here to do that, to examine ourselves. It's very, very painful. It was a painful thing for Abraham to do, to say to Ishmael, look, Ishmael, you're going to have to go. I wonder how long what age you were whenever you could see it. Maybe you were 20, maybe you were 30, maybe you were 60, and mind you, the flesh got its own way for a long time. And then you got converted. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives whenever we're saved. But the flesh will not leave very easily. The flesh will not want to yield itself to the way that the Spirit wants us to go. You see, maybe you're in our meeting this morning and in your Christian life, there's many, many areas of your life and no, you wouldn't let the Holy Spirit go there. Those are closed doors. There's many rooms in your life and no, you're in control of those areas of your life. I wonder, dear friend, do you find yourself this morning and... Just as this man Abraham had to deal with the bond woman, if you don't deal with the bond woman, she'll certainly deal with you. And she'll certainly create tremendous problems for you and problems for others and problems for your family, I'm sure, too. But the message here through Paul and through Isaiah was to cast out the bond woman because the two of them will not dwell together. And I'll say this to your friends, that Abraham, he rose up early in the morning, he was very prompt. And God has an awful lot more to show to Abraham and to teach him. But you may say to me, well, how do I actually cast out the bondwoman? Do exactly what Paul said. He said the secret in Galatians 5 and 16 was, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Verse 25 tells us, if we live in the Spirit, we should also walk in the Spirit. And walk just means depending one step at a time as God leads and God molds our lives. Cast out the bondwoman. I'll say it again, dear friends. You know what the bondwoman may be in your life today. The Holy Spirit says, look here, you should go down this route. I was saying to the young ones this morning in Bible class, I said, I'm sure the day that they were born, there was tremendous excitement. I'm sure of that. But then I used the story, and I always say to them, it's good to listen to the news, the story of those women in Bradford that were murdered this week. And I said, whenever they were brought into the world, I'm sure there was tremendous excitement. But somewhere along the road of life, from the cradle to where they eventually got to, there was a road that they decided to go down. 
And dear friends, today, the only one that is worth serving, the only one that is worth having control of our lives, is God himself. Cast out the bondwoman and let the Isaac, the spirit, as Paul tells us, take control of our lives. We're going to sing our closing hymn.